Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, it's been almost 20 years since re reality TV became a huge hit. And in that time, I've never ceased to be amazed at what people will do to make a buck. Some people will live on a deserted island while trying to vote others off. Others will go on an amazing race around the world trying to get and find things faster than others. And probably the worst of them all was a show where you had to face your fears and then eat some very disgusting and questionable things. People will embarrass themselves and they'll even put themselves in very dangerous situations just to make a dollar. Now I'll admit, there are some of those things that I'd probably be willing to do. Others, probably not. But I was reading an article this past week and it brought it to mind. What would you do for a dollar? Would you be a crash test dummy? <laughs> now, I'll make the pot even sweeter for you. You only have to be in 15, maybe 16 high-speed car crashes a year. And I will guarantee a multi-million dollar payout. Any takers? From the laughter and the head shakes, I'm betting that most of us, and it's only a guess, but most of us would turn down the offer. Most of us aren't interested in putting crash test dummy on our resume. And yet I heard this past week, and they say, and I can't tell you who they are, I don't know, and yet they say that a professional football player in the NFL in just one game experiences the equivalent forces of a high-speed automobile accident. That point was driven home this past week when a player on the San Francisco 49ers, a defensive player who had just played his rookie year and was a very outstanding rookie, turned down a very long and lucrative career, saying that the brain damage just wasn't worth the money. Now most of us, if we would turn down that type of money and that type of a career, it makes you wonder, why are there still hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of kids working so hard to play professional football? There's got to be something more to it than just the money. Now, no doubt, the money makes the decision a little bit easier. Nobody's going to put that type of risk or take that type of risk without a payout. And yet something else is at play. A love of the challenge. A love of competition. Maybe just simply a love of the game. Well, whatever it is, that something, that other, we see that in our reading for today. Our gospel reading, it comes from the 10th chapter of Mark, and as our reading begins, James and John are angling for positions of power and prestige, money and accomplishment. They ask Jesus that when he comes into his glory, that they be allowed to sit one at his right and one at his left. Now think about that for a minute. These two brothers were still under the illusion that Jesus was going to create a political Israel. And so what they're asking is that when Jesus finally kicks out the Romans and reestablishes the earthly kingdom of Israel, that they be given positions of power, something similar to that of prime minister and secretary of state. That's what they're asking for. You know, it really was a pretty audacious request in the first place. And so you can understand why the other ten disciples were a bit ticked off. 
Now, James and John, there's no doubt, they certainly knew what they wanted. But the truth is, they had no clue what they were asking for. You see, you and I, we are just one week away from celebrating and remembering the events of Holy Week. Jesus will ride into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday knowing exactly what is going to happen to him. He has predicted it no less than three times already. He will ride into Jerusalem, but then he will be betrayed and arrested. He will be mocked and scourged. And eventually, he will be crucified. And those two people who are given the honor and the privilege of being at our, Lord's and right, at our Lord's right and left hands when he comes into his glory, they're two thieves who are hung by our Lord for their crimes. And so while James and John, while they are imagining glory and power and prestige and money, Jesus is thinking of his passion and his crucifixion. But if you fast forward, it really is amazing what that one event, what the passion and crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord really does. You know, there are those who say that Jesus never lived at all. There are those skeptics who say that he lived, but he never really died. But he did. Our Lord lived. He died and he rose again. And the proof is in the reaction to those events. You see, because afterwards, James and John, they're not looking for positions of power and authority and prestige. Instead, after that world-changing event. It's all about the love of the Lord. A love that was expressed on the cross and then a love that we in turn express back to our Lord in service and devotion. As I said, James and John, after the resurrection, they were never the same again. They finally get it. James goes on and he serves the church as becoming one of its earliest martyrs. If you flip to Acts chapter 12, you'll read about how Herod Agrippa arrested James and swiftly put him to the sword. And he did it simply to appease the Jews. James is the only apostle whose martyrdom is recorded in scripture and so it is believed that he was the very first of the 12 apostles to die a martyr's death. But meanwhile, his brother John, John goes on to live a very long life. In fact, he is the only one of the 12 who isn't martyred for the faith. But rather than having a position of government power and authority, he spends the rest of his life in service to the Lord into his church. John goes on and he writes no less than five books in the New Testament, the gospel bearing his name. And he spends the rest of his time serving the Lord in his church as a pastor, a mentor, and a guide. And that type of life, that type of service is exactly what Jesus was talking about at the end of our gospel reading. Jesus said, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, that is something that the world around us has a very hard time with. And in fact, if we're honest with ourselves, it's something that we 
have a hard time with too. I mean, after all, how is it that people in our congregation, people in churches that I've served for years, give so much of their time and their talents and their devotion and their tithes to the church? I mean, we don't have to earn our salvation. We just heard about that last week. St. Paul reminded us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of your own doing, lest anyone should boast. And so there's not one of us who's really getting paid for this type of service. If we aren't being rewarded, if we aren't being elevated, if we aren't being given glory and prestige, then what's the point? Why are we doing it? But I hope that you can hear the undertext of that question itself in all the self-centeredness and the egotism that brings that question to bear. You see, greatness, at least as how our Lord defines it, is not about what we get in return. It's not about power or authority or money or any of the other things that we can lord over those around us. Instead, true greatness, really true greatness as our Lord defines it, is our ability to look beyond ourselves and self-sacrificially to love and to serve one another. And you know that really is at the heart of the Christian life. Our service to the Lord, it's no longer in the paradigm of buying and selling. You and I, we are not paid for the service that we offer to our God. He would never, never demean our service in that way. And neither do we pay him for what he so freely gives to us. He would never diminish the gift. Instead, our service springs out of a love. A love like that of a child for their dear parent. Or of a lover for their beloved. And that type of love. That type of of self-sacrificial service, it just explodes out of the cross. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. In other words, Jesus came to serve us, and specifically, he came to serve you. He died for you. He carried all of your sins and all of your burdens to the cross. And then he gave you his very body and blood to eat and to drink for your salvation. Jesus serves you. And then as St. John tells us, in his first epistle, that same St. John that was angling for a position of power and money and prestige, he writes and tells us that you and I, we are now enabled and empowered to love others because Jesus first loved us. That is why we serve. That is how we serve. And that is exactly why I want to serve. It comes out of a heart that is overflowing with love and gratitude for a Savior who died for me. You know, this last week I read about a Roman coin. I wasn't able to find a picture of it, otherwise I would have thrown it up on the screen. But this Roman coin, it had a picture of an ox on the front of it. And that ox was looking at an altar and at a plow. 
And the inscription on the coin said, ready for either. That is the Christian life. Even more so in these last days as we hear and read about all the Christians being martyred in the Middle East. And it was certainly the experience of both James and John. These two men who once jockeyed for positions of power and prestige, they found another life in Jesus Christ. James was sacrificed as a martyr. John served his whole life self-sacrificially to his Lord and his church. That type of change, it doesn't come from nowhere. We aren't suddenly changed overnight from a life of self-interest and self-satisfaction to a life of service. And in fact, there really is only one thing. There is really only one event that has the power to make that type of transformation in our lives. And that is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The very Son of God, He came down from all the glories of heaven, and He came not to be served, but to serve. To serve us, and to serve you. And by His cross, by His sacrifice, and by His love, we too are enabled to live lives of service, loving our Lord and loving one another. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior.